Bienvenidos to the Paseo Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Smizer de Leon, and we have a very familiar guest on today's episode. We're joined by Sonia Manzano, uh, actor, writer, creator, executive producer. She's one of the first leading Latina women on TV. Uh, many of you will remember her as Maria on Sesame Street. Uh, she started there 21 years old. Um, she's on the show for 44 years, taught kids, me included, uh, things about letters, numbers, a little bit of Spanish, and won 15 Emmys in the process. So uh, now she has a new endeavor, a new show called Alma's Way, follows a young Puerto Rican girl uh, with her family in, the, in New York City. Uh, it's a really cool show. I had a chance to watch a couple of episodes. So uh, we're going to talk to Sonia a little bit about her career, a little bit about the show. And at the end, we're going to ask her what being Puerto Rican means to her. Sonia, welcome to the Paseo podcast. How you doing? I, I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here and always anxious to talk about Alma's way. I'm very proud of it. Yeah, I mean, you should be. Um, and I definitely want to get into that a bit deeper. Um, okay, let's talk about career stuff. Of all things to do, why did you decide to pursue acting? The way I got into acting was that I wanted to go to college. I had a, uh, I was a very, had great grades in the Bronx. When I went to the High School of Performing Arts, uh, I was competing with middle class kids. And all of a sudden my grades plummeted because they had better educations than I did. Mm. So what to do to go to college? Oh, I had to go to college on an audition because I was determined to get into college. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I auditioned for schools, you know, like, like kids audition on, on uh, athletic scholarships. I got into acting. Now I always loved theater. That's, you know, I always loved television. I always loved to put on shows. I used to love the little rascals because they used to put shows on in the living room. So, so that was my, my, uh, my decision was really to get a higher education by hook or by crook. Mm -hmm. And it solidified kind of like my love of theater kind of matched. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, I always love hearing the experiences of someone from a working class family, knowing your dad was in a union. I think a lot of people, it tends to be a family thing. So interesting that you decided to kind of blaze your own path. And I mean, what a path you blazed. I mean, you found yourself on the set of Sesame Street, my goodness. Um, and for 44 yeah, years at that. Yeah. Um, so yes. I want to take me back to your first time walking on the set of Sesame Street, that moment you step on set. I mean, what was the first thought or, or one of the first thoughts that popped into your mind? Well, it was already kind of a thrilling show. It was on the air two years before I became a, a, a cast member on it. And I loved it because it was the first show that I saw people of color on television. When I saw Susan and Gordon, I flipped. I was at college. I was watching TV and I went, oh my gosh. And this was like in a brownstone, was like my grandmother's house in El Barrio. She lived in a brownstone like that. And uh, I was... Uh, you know, uh, thrilled that I would be the the person that Latino kids were going to look at and and uh, and hopefully relate to. But the puppets were bright. Uh, it was a an exciting place. Uh, everybody was on the same page. Everybody was thrilled. You should watch a documentary called Street Gang that really kind of captures the beginning years of Sesame Street. And I was like. Uh, my mother used to have an expression, como una cucaracha en un baile gallina. You know, I was like overwhelmed, you know, like you're a roach in a, in a chicken dance. I was overwhelmed by, by everything that was going on and wondered what I was going to, how I was going to help these people continue their mission. And you started as an actor, right? And then became a writer later? Or did you have that dual role um, from the start? You know, if I if I had ever been been exposed to writing, I think mm -hmm. I would have been a writer. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you don't see it, you can't be it. To me, writing was like something white people did, and it was something that intellectuals did. It wasn't mm -hmm. something that I did. But after a couple of years on a show, I realized what the power was. The power was in the writing. That's the it's behind the camera, not in front of it. So after I did as much as I could you know, in front of the camera. And I still love the show. I had energy. I started questioning some of the Latino bits mm -hmm. and uh, the, 
the producer Dulcie Singer said to me, well, why don't you try writing some? And I went, oh my goodness, now what? I have to put my money where my mouth is and, and actually start writing. And that's how I got into that aspect of it. Which, so which role would you say was harder, acting on Sesame Street or, or writing for the show? You know, it's so different, the two disciplines. Uh, writing is something that you ponder, you polish, you, uh, you look at very closely. That's not what you want to do when you're acting. When you're acting, you want to be, you want to be in the moment, impulsive, uh, irreverent, just follow your feelings. So there's, it's two different things. And I was really challenged when I was actually acting in one of my own scripts where, <laughs> where yeah. I wanted to adhere to the dialogue that I had written. But then I was thinking, on the other hand, <laughs> there's the acting part of me that says, ah, who cares how she wrote that? Say it how you think it. <laughs> That's fascinating. So, okay. So you mentioned questioning some of the Latino bits on Sesame Street. What, what were some of the examples that you had taken issue with during that time? I never, the Maria character, I could just be myself. I mean, they never yeah. told me, they just be yourself. You don't care what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, just be yourself. But I, but I thought that every time the curriculum called for cultural bits, it was boring. Mm -hmm. It was about food or it was about uh, congas or it was about, I mean, you know, there weren't any Latin writers, obviously. And, and I thought like, you know, and here I'm surrounded by Big Bird and Cookie Monster and, and everything is smart. Yeah. And all of a sudden, oh, we're doing this culture bit, beating kids over the head with, with this, uh, the way we're representing it. And I wanted to, to take it up a step to make it hip and yeah. smart as the rest of the show. And so the first thing I wrote was, you know, me dressed up as a Ginger Rogers dancing with Emilio Delgado as Fred Astaire, uh, doing a song called Hola, you know, because I used to love watching television so much. And I love those Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers movies. And I, you know, that, that gave it a zany quality mm -hmm. that I thought was funny yeah. in saying, oh, you know, people say hola when they mean hello and, and and like that so i i put it in that world that's super cool i um i'm fascinated by that because i, I think you're you said something really important you know when unfortunately history of film and, and television uh when puerto ricans are portrayed i mean the general general latino latina latinx population is portrayed i i often feel frustrated because it always feels very surface level um, or more like a caricature, you know, like there's a bunch of people in a writing room and they think, okay, what are all the stereotypical things we know about this particular population? <laughs> um, and let's kind of craft a story around it. So I think you being a writer really speaks to the importance of having, um, people of color, BIPOC individuals, or, or more than just one individual inside where the, in the room where it happens in those writers rooms. Um, I mean, right. from the top, right. top and bottom of the ladder throughout a set, whether that's film or television, I think representation is, is so key to getting our stories out there appropriately. Yeah, yeah, and the, so that they're sincere stories. I, I saw a movie, it was about a, uh, of course I can't remember the name of it, but but it was about a Latin, Latinx girl, gay, hmm. and her friend who was not gay, and they were looking for the pill you take after you have sexual relations and you're, worried about uh, uh, getting pregnant. And it was such a unique take that, you know, this character was so unique. It was obviously a very personal story uh, 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 written from a personal point of view. It was like not like anybody I had ever known. And I, you know, I perked up, I leaned in to watch it. It was interesting. No, I, I hear that. I mean, it's some of my favorite content to watch is stuff that really leans into its authenticity. Um, something that doesn't whitewash our community and really gets into those niche things that, you know, and instead of saying chisme, you're, they're saying bochinche. You know what I mean? Like just like little <laughs> things like that. Um, uh, they just really stand out to me. Um, so looking at these experiences uh, or looking back on these experiences, uh, the importance of representation, you know, you being in the writer's room on Sesame Street, um, you know, how did you take those experiences and apply them to your creation of Alma's Way? 
Oh, that's a great yeah. question. Well, Alma, Alma is very, very personal to me. Uh, when PBS asked me to create a, a, a family show of a Latinx family, I, of course, made them Puerto Rican from the South Bronx because that's what I am. That's yeah. what I know. And uh, But it wasn't just uh, a culture show. It was about the, the show is about thinking. I just noticed that a lot of kids are turned off to thinking or they think they're not smart because they can't memorize, they can't speak English, there's 35 kids in a classroom. And they were thinking that they weren't smart because they couldn't take tests well. I thought, wow, you know, they're turned off to the joys of using your mind without even starting to do that. So that, you know, that that's the theme of the show. But I made it uh, uh, as personal as I could. Uh, the characters are based on characters in my own family. My family was very musical. So Mommy in Alma's Way is a music teacher. So we could have the opportunity to have aguinaldos and bombas and plenas and salsa in the show. Um, I'm in the show. I play, I play my own grandmother. No, wait. I play my mother. <laughs> <laughs> she has my name. A Granny Isa is is a person that I that that, that I voice on the show, and um, personal experiences like the time Willie Colon came to my house in the South mm. Bronx. He was a kid. I was a kid. He had a band. I was depressed. My cousin was in his band. He showed up and serenaded me on my birthday, and it was a wonderful, wonderful moment. Can I ask you a quick <laughs> Willie Colon question? I have uh, a vinyl of El Malo in my record collection. Uh, one of my favorite records. Um, was your cousin yeah. involved in that record? Yes. Oh. yes. My cousin is, wow. is on that. Uh, uh, Eddie, okay. Eddie Guagua Rivera. Yeah. Oh yeah. Who, who inspired the character Eddie Mambo. Wow. Uh, on Alma's Way. Who, who's a combination of two characters. I knew this kid who had polio who used to love to mambo. That's... Mm -hmm. uh, so Eddie Mambo on Alma's Way is a combination of those two people, my cousin and this kid who had polio. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, uh, wow, just to be in the presence of Willie Colon, I'm just super jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so wow. the group was called the group was called the group was called the Caribbean Combo. By the way, Caribbean that was Combo. The kid group. <laughs> oh, I love that. So um, it's clear you're taking in personal experiences and fusing them into um, your writing, the different narratives that exist from one episode to the next of Alma's Way. Um, I, I am fascinated by how Puerto Rican culture is portrayed because we talked about this a little earlier saying how a lot of times, you know, maybe it's whitewashed or it leans into stereotypes or it's very surf surface level. It feels like almost, and this is not a knock, but like watching Alma's way, it's just her Puerto Ricanness is a part of her. It's not something that's like smushed in your face. Like, Hey, don't forget she's Puerto Rican. It's almost, it's just a, it's just a part of her being. It's who she is. And that just is woven into different aspects of her life, her interaction with their family. And it's not just siloed parts of her identity. Um, would you say that's fair to say? Yes, yes. And it, the reason that we were able to do that is because everybody's Latin, mostly everybody's Latin on the team. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of Cubans and, yeah. and Dominicans and, and Puerto Ricans in the show, but that basic Latin understanding is there. And I think that's why it, it filters through. I had a friend who said to me that if everybody rem recall all the Godfather movies and Martin Scorsese and all of a sudden there was this explosion of Italian talent mm -hmm. in the 80s. And, and uh, uh, my friend who's Native American, Buffy St. Marie, he's na na Native Canadian, uh, she, said, you, she said the reason that all of those, that there was that explosion of Godfather movies and Italian movies and about Italian people is because everybody was Italian on the team. So they didn't have to explain stuff to each other. They, they, they knew what they were talking about. So Coppola, I mean, everybody, everybody was on the same page immediately. My friend Buffy St. Marie was saying, that's why 
uh, she was talking about Native American movies. She says, you know, every, people are different. They're trying to get this, but everybody's trying to explain this to this person who's from a different culture, yada, yada, yada. She says, the reason the Italian movies like, you know, exploded. Everybody, I mean, you had De Niro on the same page as Pacino and the Pesci. Coke, you know, so they all- It's like a little Italian rat page. pack. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so that I think, uh, I mean, that's a good way to put it. But, you know, let's hope that Alma's way is like a little Puerto Rican Latino rat pack yeah. of artists that understand each other right from the get go. And you don't have to take time uh, explaining, I, this is a pastel and this is how you eat it. And oh my, yes. you know, it, it's known, it's mm -hmm. understood. Get on to the next thing. <laughs> what do you hope children and their, and their parents uh, will get out of watching Alma's Way? Well, obviously, uh, um, I hope that they see themselves represented. I, you know, I can't believe that people are still saying this. Actors half my age are saying that, you know, they felt bad they weren't represented in the media. When I was a kid in the 50s, I used to watch Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, all of those shows you can see on TV land. And I used to wonder, uh, uh, where I was, where I fit in. I mean, you know, it was like looking through a hole into the white world through these TV shows, but you wondered what you were going to be when you grew up, what job you were going to have, and you felt invisible, you know, and uh, uh, if you feel invisible, you're not going to contribute to society that you feel doesn't see you. So obviously, I'm hoping that kids, Latin kids, see Alma and go, oh, there I am. I'm, you know, I would do this like Alma, or, you know, I don't think Alma was too cool doing that or whatever they say, it doesn't matter, but uh, that they see somebody like them. That's obviously the one thing. I hope that they realize how wonderful it is to use their brains, that they have power, that I think we treat kids like they're empty vessels that we just have to teach. And it's not that. They have their own opinions. They bring stuff to the table. They see the world however they see it, you're of a different generation than I, you see the world differently than I do. So does a very young kid. And uh, so I hope people take that, yeah. that away from the show. And, um, and I, the basic legacy is I hope they say, I hope society says, wow, you know, when that, when that Alma's Way was first aired, all of a sudden there was a bunch of shows with a lot of different points of views and a lot of diversity, and I don't mean uh, diverse policing of this show. I mean created by diverse people, mm -hmm. not academics looking and saying, oh, this is right, or this is wrong, or this is accurate, but underneath the artist creating it. Yeah. I bet you didn't expect me to go on and on that long. No, hey, that was all gold. <laughs> no, I... I I'm all here for it. Um, and, and there's one thing specifically that you mentioned, Sonia, you were talking about how, you know, when you were young, you were basically looking through a people. I mean, like a, a, a door, like a, you just can't, you're like a little crack in the wall. Uh, I don't really see myself. Um, and something exactly. that we still struggle with a lot of, of younger um, Latina, Latino, Latinx actors, actresses. Um, so it's something a very much a reality today. Um, but I don't think realizing that lack of representation wouldn't be possible without flexing that critical thinking muscle. Like, hey, something's different here. Why? And why is that? Um, and I, I, I say that because I noticed in each episode of Alma's Way, she's using critical thinking. It's like a whole like segment of, <laughs> of, the, of an episode. Um, and it's really cool. I'm, you know, I kind of see her thought process live for the viewer. Um, can you speak to the importance of children seeing that, seeing critical thinking and mindfulness on their on their TV screen? Um, and and I, I remember you mentioning that, you know, we expect kids to memorize everything um, and we don't flex enough of those critical thinking muscles. So just just curious, you know, can you speak to the importance of children seeing that? Well, I, th I think that, the you know, as I said, I think that these kids thought they were not smart because they couldn't memorize and or they couldn't pass tests. And uh, I wanted them to see critical thinking, separating one idea from another, um, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I was struck by uh, watching the Ken Burns 
PBS special on Muhammad Ali and the beauty of him, the way he separated one idea from another was g gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And the Malcolm X did that as well. That was, you know, the highlight of, uh, of critical thinking. And that, that's what it is. It's separating one idea from another. It's not all good and all bad. America is getting to be a country that hates nuance. And I didn't say it, Trevor Noah said it. He said, you know, you know, it's 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 not black and white. Things, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, if, if this is true here, then this might be true here. And uh, uh critical thinking is it's is kind of being lost. And uh, you know, I think as a society we have to really address that and and um, encourage young people to think critically, think of this, see the bigger picture. I did a lot as a kid. I, yeah. I did that a lot as a kid. I, just, uh, uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, you know, put two and two together. And I remember escaping into my mind and looking at a manhole mm -hmm. cover and saying, wait, it's not only a manhole cover, it's also a circle. And it's also the letter O, you know, and it's mm -hmm. finding, it's, these are simple ideas that a four or five-year-old might have, sure. but you have to practice that, I think. Yeah. No, I, I think I think that's spot on. I mean, I, in that same in that same vein, looking at the current environment, you know, really trying to um, present that nuance to the viewer. Um, you know, what challenges do you feel creators face when they're developing TV shows for children? I mean, do you think that and, and I guess, do you think that you were able to navigate those challenges in the creation of Alma's Way? I think I was able to navigate those challenges. I mean, it's not, uh, it, it's challenging. You have to work with people on television. I'm also a book writer, you know, and I like writing books because you're all alone or if it's one editor, but television is a group effort. You can't get around that. And I think that uh, uh, a lot of people creating children's television wanna, wanna give kids answers. They want to teach and give them answers. They forget about the artistry of it. They forget that the kid has, you know, mm -hmm. they're not they're, they're not stupid. They're just uninformed and they're little. They're young, <laughs> and uh, so I like things to be a little open ended at the. But a lot of people creating children's television want to give specific lessons, but you do, it's give and take, and you you keep pressing with your idea. I always say this. Everybody has a little bit of power. And I know that because, and this is the example I use. When I first got on Sesame Street, there was a fruit cart. I tell the story all the time. There was a fruit cart. And uh, Matt Robinson said to me, you're not only here to be the cute Latina, you have to make sure the Latino content is accurate. And I thought to myself, who elected me president of Puerto Ricans? I'm just... <laughs> And, but I know, but I thought about it and I noticed that the fruit cart had apples and bananas and et cetera. And I thought if this was a diverse neighborhood, it would have platanos and guineos and co coconuts. So I went to the producer and I said, I think you have to put this kind of fruit in the fruit cart. And they did it. So I diversified the first fruit cart on television. I'm saying I didn't have a lot of power, but I used the little bit that I had. So as a creative person, use the power you have without losing the job. I, I think without that, having to step away from the table. Yeah. Well, I think that fruit cart as a young person, if you're growing up with, you know, banas, guineo, but you don't see that on TV, maybe then you start to not see the value in the produce that comes from your culture. Maybe you start yeah. to see yeah. like, oh, bananas and apples are where it's at, where you could probably get that same level of nutrients through other uh, produce that's grown on La Isla. Um, so I, I think yeah, even that yeah. small example, I mean, can be very powerful for a young, you know, from uh, a young person's mind. Um, well, I get I get discouraged when when artists say oh, it's not my way. I, you know, Latin artists, I can't do it, and they step away from the table. But then, mm. you know, it's not done. You know, yeah, yeah. I just say change the fruit cart. It's a little thing, but it's something. Yeah. Um, was there, I have one last question for you, but was there anything else that you want to let people know about Alma's way? 
Uh, the music is fabulous in Alma's way. Music is important to me. I loved music and uh, Sesame Street, as you know, has a history of having wonderful music uh, all through the years. And I certainly want to continue with that sensibility and uh, please watch and uh, discuss it with your kid after you watch it. <laughs> and actually one last thing on that. Didn't, I may have this wrong, so keep me honest. Uh, but Lynn manuel Miranda wrote the theme song for Alma's Way, right? Is that right? Oh, of course. How could I not yeah. mention that? Just thought oh, I'd bring my... it up. Just thought I'd bring it up. The beautiful man. You know, I knew him from Sesame Street, and uh, uh, but I knew his father. His father was an activist, hmm. Puerto Rican activist for many years, and uh, he's close to my age. And uh, I called his father up and I said, "Hook me up with your son." <laughs> And when I finally got a, a, a chance to talk to Lynn, I said, I said, look, if I had the talent and the power, I'd make this opening song as wonderful as the opening song in In the Heights. Mm. Well, I mean, we just had one conversation and he, you know, he can say with three words what it takes everybody <laughs> else, a hundred words. To say. So he, he truly nailed it. There's little lie, there's hip hop. So many questions, so much to explain. Oh. Figure it out. He tells the whole story of of the series in in his lyrics, and then Bill Sherman did a beautiful job of uh, of uh, writing the music and compose and connecting different musical styles. So there's a, a rap in the song at the end that Summer Rose sings because it is the Bronx. You have to have some rap. Of course, so I'm happy with with. Yeah. A little bit happy. I'm thrilled with hey. Manuel's parts. Right. I mean, that's what I was gonna say. It's a pretty rocking theme song. I mean, it's probably one of the better ones I've I've seen in children's television. Hola, Joshua Smizer de Leon here, founder and host of the Basel Podcast. Thanks for listening to the show, where we highlight stories by, from, and about the Puerto Rican community from La Isla to the diaspora. If you want to help us share the diverse and vibrant stories that make up the Puerto Rican communities here on Paseo, Boricua, and Chicago and around the world, subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you stream your podcasts. Subscribing helps more people find the show and will help you make sure you never miss an episode. Leaving a five-star rating and showing some love in the comments helps too. You can also give a donation by looking up the Paseo podcast on savechicagomedia.org. Okay, that's enough from me. Enjoy the show. Okay, I know we only have a few minutes left with you, Sonia. So uh, before we share with people how they can keep up with you, keep up with or learn more about Alma's Way, I just wanted to ask you one little uh, question we've been asking all of our guests. And, um, you know, for people that have heard the show or regularly listen to the show, they've heard me explain this ad nauseum. So apologize for any listeners. But um, Jasmine Camacho Quinn brought Puerto Rico our second ever gold medal. And when she, after she won, I saw a lot of discussion online from people questioning her Boricuanes, basically saying she doesn't deserve her Boricua card because she wasn't born on the island. She doesn't speak Spanish. Um, I would ar also argue that she's Afro-Latina. So there, I felt like there was a base, definitely a racist undertone in that criticism. Now I've met tons of people that love her. So I don't know how big that sample size is of people questioning her Boricua card. But I think that's something that resonates with a lot of people, especially people in the diaspora um, and even some people on La Isla, you know, so that's that inspired this question, you know, what does being Puerto Rican mean to us? So just curious to hear your own personal thoughts, you know, what does being Puerto Rican mean to you? Oh, my goodness. That's kind of a loaded question. I'm I know. sorry that people get <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm sorry that people get concerned with what's the true, mm -hmm. you know, this is a real Boricua, this is not a real Boricua. I mean, it's a waste of time and it just divides us. And, I, you know, it's not important. I, I, uh, I mean, we're all Boricuas and we're all different. I mean, we're all, you know, on Alma's Way, I've met a lot of Boricuas who are of different generations and, and uh, Jersey girl Boricuas and Brooklyn Boricuas who hate salsa and I mean and love hip hop and you know it's it's uh it's uh it seems a waste of time to me to to decide who's the real the true blue we're all Boricua and uh, um um and 
we have to celebrate all the wonderful things that that we are as opposed to you know uh, disseminating them or breaking them down well said um so looking at uh you know where we go from the end of this episode if people want to keep up with you learn more about alma's way how would they be able to do that well, certainly to know more about On This Way, go to pbskids.com. By the way, it's in Spanish as well, if people want to check it out in Spanish. Uh, it's in Puerto Rico as well. My cousin emailed me and said, whoa, <laughs> you know, whoa. <laughs> she was so happy. And I said, oh, I have to brush up on my Spanish to talk to her, which is part of the uh, uh, what you were saying, that we're, we're all over. Uh, so... Go there. And then, of course, I'm on the internet. I have my website. If anybody wants to drop me a line, I'd love to hear from people. Beautiful. Okay. Sonia Manzano, thank you so much for being on the Basel podcast. My pleasure.